But it's so funny. I, I sit and I think about this a lot. If, you, if we didn't go to the same school, like, I don't know where my life would have ended up. I wouldn't be a wrestler. I know that. Hey, good to see you. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. If you happen to listen to my podcast, you've already heard this conversation because I release all my interviews on my podcast first, and then I put them on YouTube a few days later so you can see all of our facial expressions. So click the link down below to check out my podcast called Insight with Chris Van Vliet. That's the new name of the show. And you can hear that wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is such a great conversation with one of the nicest guys in all of wrestling. And TJ won't know this because we did this interview over Zoom, but I smelled really good during this interview. Like, really good since I became a Scentbird subscriber. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you choose from over 600 different cologne and perfume brands. Instead of spending hundreds of dollars on cologne, like seriously, some colognes are like $500. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every single month for just 15 bucks. Oh, and you get to pick what you want. It's not like they go, oh, here's the cologne of the month. Oh, no, no. You actually decide which one you want to try. So here's what it looks like when you get it. And watch this little twist. And oh! Oh, that's good. So now that I smell even better than I did at the start of this video, I wish this was smell-o-vision here. Let me show you what you get here. That is an awful lot of cologne for $15. That's actually a 30-day supply, and it's eight times bigger than those little sampler spritzers that you get. So maybe you're like, CBV, that sounds like a great deal, but I don't know what kind of cologne or perfume that I like. Even better, because you can take a simple quiz on Scentbird and then you can discover new fragrances. So I've been a Scentbird subscriber for three months now, which is why I have one, two, three different fragrances. So I started off with Dolce & Gabbana Light Blue Pour Homme. Bet you didn't know I spoke French. Play bien. It's a very sweet smelling cologne and despite everyone wearing masks, I get complimented on this one like quite a bit. Then I tried Versace Man Eau Fraiche which I believe translates to mean fresh water. This is like a lighter, like fruitier smell. What kind of fruit is this actually? Star fruit. Yeah, that's why it smells so good. Then I just got my third one sent to me the other day. This is Prada Luna Rasa Sport. And this is more like, um, like a lavender or vanilla type of fragrance. It's actually hard to decide which one I wanna wear every single day, but they have a lot of niche scents as well. So I've just added Vince Camuto Terra Extreme and Michelle Germain Sexual Noir Pour Homme to my queue for the next two months to test them out because the descriptions on those sound amazing. Oh, so remember how I said it was 15 bucks a month? Well, that's the price if you're not friends with me. Since you are friends with me, it's 30% off. Your first month is just 10 bucks. Yeah, 10 bucks for all that designer fragrance. So click the link in the description and use my code CVV to take that simple quiz on Scentbird and find out which fragrances are best suited for you. Again, just 10 bucks for your first month. 10 bucks. Man, what a gym you have there. That's incredible. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, the pandemic kind of forced this out of me. I, uh, I thought about how much I didn't want a home gym for so long. And I thought that it would kind of uh, kill like that gym vibe and kind of, I would almost get a little complacent, I thought. And uh, it's been the opposite. It's, um, I, I, I saw uh, one of the, I, I ran into Christian and he was talking about his home gym. We were talking the other day and uh, he just said like, same thing, like he, he wasn't sure and he just said like we were talking we were sharing stories you just have to become creative a little bit and kind of figure out like what you need i just and i'm always ordering like a new attachment like hey i oh yeah i missed this from the gym and i'll order a new attachment and so it's a work in progress but it's coming along do you think that when the pandemic's over you want to go back to a gym or are you like nope i'm a home gym guy now uh, yeah i'm a home gym guy now i you know obviously except for when i'd be on the road but otherwise sure. if i'm in if i'm at home i'm working out at home did, did we plan to have a cat in the background? I love this. No, so he's like, he's funny. So if I'm in here, he'll just be scratching at the door. He, he's the only one I have five, but he loves coming in here. Who is that? Uh, Louie, Big Louie. Hey, Big Louie. <laughs> I'm going to say hi. Yeah, dude, he, he does not be in this gym, this guy. Oh, yeah, my pretty, God. He's my biggest one. He's probably like 12 pounds, 13 hey, pounds. Hey, buddy. Stuff. I was, I was wondering if we would see a cat and then how long it would take to see a cat. 
22 seconds. New record. Nobody loves cats more than Tyson Kidd. No, man. The Hart family, we, we love these cats, dude. You do? Who loves cats more, you or Natty? Um, I think me. She she loves, like, obviously she loves them all. She loves two paws, but, like, I, I'm pretty impartial to, like, all five of them. Right. So other than the gym setup you've got here, what else has changed for you over the last, I guess it's 10 months now? It's crazy. I just was calculating like how long it's been. Um, man, I don't, I haven't seen the inside of an airport in a very long time. That's Let crazy. me move this back. It might make the lighting a little bit better. Sure, man. Whatever works for you. Sorry. Yeah, I guess you're just, you're driving to work now. Yeah. Uh, so I drive, I drive to work, man. I drive, uh, you know, during this entire thing, which has, you know, been a, it's been a learning process, I guess, and almost like trial and error in some ways, but like originally, you know, we're at the performance center. And so I'm just, I'm 90 minutes from there. And then, uh, then we moved to Amway, which I'm 90 minutes from there too. And now it's at uh, Tropicana field in St. Pete, which is like less than an hour for me. Yeah. So it, it's wild. Like when I leave at night and like, I know like I'm home in under an hour, it's unbelievable because that is not the norm. I mean, that I'm getting used to it because that's been the last 10 months, but I know in the big picture, this is not the norm of what we do. Yeah, what city is it that you guys actually live in? I live in uh, Wesley Chapel, so just north of Tampa. Okay, well, it's, all the wrestlers live in either Tampa or Orlando. I feel like. Yeah, Land. Yeah, and there's like, and there's other ones, Land Lakes, Lutes. Like we're all like scattered in this little, not all, but the Florida people are in this little, uh, little radius. You probably had the frequent flyer miles for like your entire life. You had all that, you know, all the status on every airline. <laughs> now you haven't even been on a plane in a year. It's, it's insane. Um, I, so I'll see some of the, I'll talk to some of the talent and some of the people who are flying in, like some, like some people like Pat Buck, he, he lives in New York. So he flies in as a producer, he flies in from New York. So like for him, it, it has changed because obviously now he's just flying to one destination, like always Orlando or now Tampa, but he's yeah. always at the airport. So I'm like, is it, is it weird flying? And I don't know if they even know what I'm asking because like, <laughs> yeah, it, it is weird, but it's also so weird. I don't know to me, not being at an airport for this long. And I, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, uh, if I am complaining about it or if I really miss it. I'm not, I'm not sure which one it is. Well, once it gets back to normal, I'll be complaining about the airports. But in this moment, I really, there's a part of me that misses the airports. Yeah, there's like, there's a certain like hustle about it. Cause a lot of my job was going to the airport and flying yeah. a ton. I've flown six times now, I think. Actually, I was in Calgary two weeks ago. Visiting my sister. Yeah, I was in, I was in Calgary for Christmas. Wow, this is the longest I haven't been home. I haven't been uh, home since a live event in September, 2019. Wow. Well, I got. Well, I, I was planning to go up for the stampede, but then of course there was no uh, stampede this year. No stampede. Well, I got to tell you, when I landed at YYC, there was like yeah. six people there. <laughs> wow. Now you have to take a COVID ago. test as soon as you land. You have to quarantine until you get your results, but they do it rapid tests. So when you okay. get the results, yes. you can come out of quarantine. But yeah, there was like six people there. Wow, man. Yeah, I miss Calgary. It's, like I said, it's been this is the longest in my whole life I haven't been to Calgary. Yeah, it's wild. You're looking very, very ripped, very jacked, by the way. Trying to, trying to. I was trying to find my white workhorse shirt. I couldn't find it. I'm, I was oh, like, well, we can just promote right workhorse. He's looking for his own shirt, and he's mad he's got Julie's shirt on. <laughs> so I was looking everywhere before this interview to find it. Um, I'm trying, man, just, just training as hard as I can. And you know, there was a period at the beginning of the quarantine, I was you know, just eating a ton of cereal at night, and then I like kicked out of that. And... Um, I trained hard throughout the whole thing, but now I've upped the training a little bit and dropped, uh, dropped the empty calories a little bit. Right. Well, you do not look like a 40 year old. I can't believe you're 40. Yeah, man. And that was what I was kind of looking forward to, uh, going to the stampede this year and my 40th birthday. But, uh, yeah, man, I, I was, uh, Natty called me out on it a little bit before, but I was saying it like the whole time I was 39 that I couldn't wait to be 40. I just thought it'd be kind of, I don't, don't ask me what I think, but I thought it'd be kind of cool that, uh, to be 40 years old. And, and, uh, I knew, I knew how I looked at 39 and I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to age insanely, uh, like accelerated in a one year. So I should look pretty much the same. So I'm looking forward to being 40. Man. I don't know if anybody in wrestling smiles more than you do. I love it. Yeah. I do smile a lot. I get, I get told that a lot. And my laugh is very, uh, loud and carries and it's very unique. <laughs> 
It, you know what? I, was, I caught myself laughing, and it's sometimes like uh, uh, Ray Liotta and Goodfellas when they're at the, the bar scene right before, uh, I think, Spider gets his feet shot. Yeah, it's just infectious. Like you've got this laugh, this smile. It's like so infectious. Who would not want to be around you? Uh, I mean, I'm, there, there, I'm sure there's people and there are some. I guess. I don't know. The cats seem to want to be around you all the time. The cats definitely do at all times. Did you ever think at any point during this quarantine that you might bring back that old haircut? Uh, <laughs> I wonder what, uh, wonder what that haircut does in, the, in a producer role. I wonder. Um, I think you could do that. I mean, I, I, I'm sure I could. I, I've, I've, uh, I've never thought about bringing it back. I, I kind of needed it. I've, I've explained the story a couple of times, but I needed it as something to kind of stick out. I knew I wasn't. Uh, I knew I wasn't a big guy. I knew I wasn't in in WWE world with the land of the giants, um, and I knew that. Uh, I knew I had a, a bit of charisma, a decent amount. Like I, I knew I had a little bit and I knew uh, I knew that I needed a lot of work with promo. So I needed a little something, at least on my tryout. I, I knew I could, I knew I could wrestle in the ring. And that was um, Carl DeMarco is the one who helped me get a tryout. And he told me, he was like almost calling me up a couple weeks prior, like almost like maybe once a week or once every two weeks, almost like kind of, I guess almost like a coach or trying to pump me up like a motivator. And he was just like, Hey, listen, you got to go there. Like you're going to be smaller than some of those guys, but that's fine. He's like, just go in as best shape as you can. I remember he, he kept saying this, be as, be as, be really tanned. And I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, man, you just gotta, you can't let anyone there out wrestle you for your whole tryout. You got to out wrestle everybody. And I was like, I mean, I'll, I'll do my best. And um, so that was his advice to me. And so I knew like, obviously a lot of it was going to be on my wrestling in terms of, uh, you know, getting the thumbs up or thumbs down, but I, I just, I had that hair. I knew I kind of needed, a, and I had a prior to WWE. I had it when I was wrestling in Japan too. But I, need, I knew I needed a little something that where you go, like, if nothing else, like, and this is maybe not even the perfect mindset, but if nothing else, it's like, oh, the guy with the hair, at least it gives you at least something. Yeah, in this producer role, are you wearing suits to to Tropicana Field every day now, every week? Yeah, I'm. I'm I have my. Uh, my my own style. Uh, I have uh, the suit minus the. So I'll wear the. Uh, I have a lot of nice suits. I just wear the pants and I'll wear like a fitted like tight t shirt. Uh, okay. And then, but I don't, it, well, right now it's obviously a little bit cooler because we're it's January, but still we're in Florida. I don't really want to wear the jacket. It's too hot, man. Yeah, cool in Florida <laughs> is like a temperature that begins with a seven. But like like yesterday when I left uh, the Thunderdome. It was, it was real cold in there. And I, like, and it, it's so funny, like I'll, I'll go back in a few days and it'll probably be really hot. It's, it's never been the same twice so far, the Tropicana one. And um, hmm. when I came outside yesterday, I'm, I was like bracing for the cold. And uh, cause it was real cold in there. And I figured, oh, it's probably even colder outside. Cause I mean, obviously, like you said, it doesn't get super cold, but I think last week or the week before it was like 50 something. I came outside and it was, it was warmer outside than been in the Thunderdome and I was like, oh, never mind. I, I, I live in Florida. It's all good. That is the most bizarre thing. I lived in Florida for five years. It's the most bizarre thing to like leave a restaurant at night and then oh, you walk yeah. outside and it's hotter outside at night yes. than it is where you just came from. And that it's all the time. That's all the time in, in Florida, as you know. It's so wild. So look, we know what N Natalia's parents did for a living. I'm really curious to know what did your parents do for a living? Um, my so I grew up single uh, single parent home with my mom and my two sisters. Um, my mom she had a bunch of different jobs uh, growing up. Like she was like usually like a secretary, but a secretary at like different places. Um, and now she handles like phones for uh, Calgary Transit. She works for the city, and she uh, she works with um, I uh, I guess like maybe like special assistance, um, arranging rides for people that need special assistance. And so that's what she does. And she's been there now with that city for uh, over a decade, for sure. She's been there for a while. Yeah. What's your first memory of watching wrestling? Man, my first. So I, I <laughs> maybe a year ago, I YouTube this because I like, just was like, let me see if this match happened to see if my memory is even somewhat even close. 
and the match happened. It's probably it probably is not what I saw, but um, my cousin showed me wrestling for the first time. Uh, I have an, an older cousin of mine, and um, for whatever reason, the two teams that stuck out. Of, of course, so it's very funny. It was two tag teams. Now that just hit me right now, sitting here. It's funny that uh-huh. it's two tag teams, and I had my success in tag teams. Yeah. Um, uh, the Killer Bees and Demolition. And then I looked it up, and they had a match. They had a couple matches. Don't know if this happened to be one I saw, or if like they both were on the show, or I saw graphics of one. But I just remember walking, like leaving, knowing of these guys, the Killer Bees and Demolition. I thought Demolition looked so cool. And uh, I came home, and I um, I uh, practiced some moves I saw on TV on my two younger sisters, and wrestling was quickly banned in my house. <laughs> And very how old, quickly how old were you at this point i was about eight or nine <laughs> and then when did you decide in your life you know what wrestling something i think i want to do for a living so then um i became friends with teddy in uh, teddy hart in in elementary school and he kept you guys begging. went to the same school yeah and it, it's so funny i i sit and i think about this a lot if you if we didn't go to the same school, like, I don't know where my life would have ended up. I wouldn't be a wrestler. I know that because like once wrestling got banned in my house, so it wasn't like I had this crate. I it hadn't been bit big enough to like fight it being banned. When it got banned, I was like, okay, well, I still got Ninja Turtles and all this other stuff. So wrestling was a show I saw one time at that point. It just wow. happened to make me try a couple moves on. It, it didn't make me. I, I made me, but I tried a couple moves on my sisters and then went away really quickly. Um, so if, man, if I didn't go to school with Teddy, who knows, but he was very insistent on me coming to his house and, uh, kept telling me he lived in a gym. And when you're a kid, a gym, you think of a gymnasium, like at my school where we play floor hockey. Nope. His dad owns a legit gym. So I come walking into this massive gym and he lived on like this quarters that like above. And I just remember like, seeing all these big humans walking around and it was like a real hardcore gym. And I just remember being like, what is this? And he introduced me to this woman who was riding the bike and he said, Oh, this is George. She said, hi, nice to meet you. Well, ter- that's his mom. Turns out that's his mom. I-, I remember thinking, why is he introduced me to gym members? That's his mom. He calls her to this day. He calls her George. Her name's Georgia. Wow. Uh, so anyway, now, now I'm friends with them, I'm friends with Ted and just wrestling took over. And, um, SummerSlam, when I saw SummerSlam 92, Brett versus Davey, I was like, that was the moment where I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I don't know how, how do I do it? But seeing that and seeing that a match could look like that, I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Did you know that, like, did that match Brett versus Davey mean so much to you because of their relation to Teddy? Yeah. Oh, for sure. That definitely like added to it. And at that point I'd been like, I became friends with Ted in 1990, and, but like, if anyone who, if you know Ted, it, things are very uh, intense at all times in terms of like, if Ted and I were friends, that means that we're friends and we're together like all day, every day. And if not, like if we're, if we're not, then he would like call me from home and that it just like, uh, like I was around him all the time and I was around him. So then I, you know, then next thing you know, I'm getting invited up to Sunday dinners at Stu. So now I'm meeting the family. I'm, in, I'm introduced to like everybody. <clears throat> it's like something out of like Godfather or something. It's like, okay, uh, I'm in. And, and, that's, uh, and that's where you eventually met Natty, right? Through all of that. Yes. 100%. Yeah. I met her at Stu's house. Man. Like you, people talk about high school sweethearts. You guys have known each other since you were how old and she was how old? Um, I probably met her. I probably met her around 92, maybe 93. Cause she lived in Florida at the time. So I didn't meet her for a couple of years later, but yeah. So I'm like 12 or 13. And she was how old? Uh, she would have been like, uh, so I was probably, I was probably 13 or 14. I mean, maybe, maybe they came up in like 94. She would have been like 12. Man. And yeah. then how long after that did you guys start officially dating? Um, I was, I was uh, 20, 21. So you guys knew each other so for it, a long it was time. A while. Yeah. It was still a while. Wow. It's so amazing. I put in a lot of time and a lot of work, believe me. <laughs> I'm sure she would say the same about you. Uh, I put in a lot of time. She, 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 she's told the story many times. She did not like me at first because uh, Teddy's Teddy. So anyone who's kind of friends with Teddy is kind of also maybe 
the Wilmer kids is awesome. Well, if he's friends with Ted, maybe he's kind of mischievous as Ted too. Maybe he's kind of bad too. Uh, so I was painted with that brush for a little while, but I didn't, you know, it was worth it. So, you, I mean, you're officially now part of the Hart family. You've married into the Hart family, but it sounds yeah. like for a long time, you were just kind of like the adopted member of that family. Oh yeah. Like I, man, I, I live with, um, I live with Davey and, um, Diana and Harry before for a little period of time. I lived at Stu's for a while. Um, I spend a lot of time with, <clears throat> with Brett in terms of like, uh, I remember there was a period of time, like after school every day, Teddy and I about 16 years old would go train at Brett's house. And mm. um, sometimes, sometimes with Brett, sometimes he'd watch us. Sometimes he wouldn't even be home, but um, we were, we were allowed to come to his house and train. So we were, he saw, he saw us wrestle a match. So he saw us wrestling at Stu's once and he like, and then he thought like he, he's told me a story where he's like, wow, these guys actually, these guys are kind of, even though he knew we were kids, he's like, okay, I, I've seen them. He's pulled up a few times and seen us in the ring. Like every time he pulls up, he's like, man, these guys are maybe a little bit serious about this. And we're only 16 years, 15 years old. And then, um, then he, so he's not, he's not like technically back yet, but there was a live event in Calgary that we wrestled on in 1996. Uh, Brett maybe comes back on raw, like maybe a week or two, three weeks later is when he does the promo where he says he's back. He's going to wrestle Steve Austin at Starbucks series, but he came by that show. And then after that, he's like, wow, he said, it's so f- cool to watch you guys. I didn't realize you guys take it this seriously. And we, we didn't know anything about like wrestling rules etiquette. We were just for kids, but, and he, then that's when he kind of offered the, the invitation to kind of come up and train with him. Wow. So yeah. if you're living with Stu Hart, are the stories about the dungeon true? Like, did, did, like, is it every day he takes people down there and stretches them? Um, so not every day when I'm around because uh, obviously he's older at that time, but, but I, I've been stretched by Stu a few times. Um, but sometimes though, here's the thing. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> Stu didn't need to make that trek down to the dungeon. Sometimes you could get that stretching right there in the kitchen. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> the, the dungeon wasn't just exclusive it could happen anywhere man uh, we once we once filmed a show for uh ytv i remember uh, ytv <laughs> i think did we talk about this last time alpha 2 omega no oh so i i did a i did a i've seen it back like i've seen like a little portion of it one time i've never really seen it, it uh the show alpha 2 omega harry and i did some wrestling match on there and um, at one point, Stu stretching people, I was like stretch, maybe the camera guy, but he'd already stretched me. And then he called Harry over and Harry's really young at this time. Harry's like uh, 12 or 13. And he called Harry over and Harry, like we're outside by the ring and Harry ducked down under the ring. So now Stu just sees me and then he calls me over. And I remember like kicking Harry. And I was like, you asshole. And I was like, I knew like, do, and I went and uh, I was wearing this little like, thin uh tank top because we were about to do this match and now Stu's stretching me on the uh on the concrete my back's all scraped up and oh my you know he's, he's just demoing holds and the, the guys the camera guys are recording it and i was just like every single thing hurts and it hurts times 10 because this gravel really hurts too thanks harry <laughs> harry's hiding under the ring on the grass is there ever a time when you guys would get to stretch Stu? oh no way no way <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> that never happened. No, and the roles never got reversed. Man, that's funny. You know, being that close to the Hart family, being in the Hart family, can you take me back to where you were when Owen passed away at Over the Edge? Yeah, I was, uh, <clears throat> we were watching the pay-per-view up at um, Davey and Diana's house, which is literally up the hill from Stu's, like less than like a three minute drive to Stu's. And so we were up there watching it, um, watching the pay-per-view and there, there was, a, there was a bunch of us. So like, you know, if, if a bunch of people get together and watch pay-per-view, you don't, you don't just sit and you're not just hanging on the, you're not just hanging on to every word. You're, you're, you're all talking and you're watching the show, but you're all talking. So like, we, you know, you see Owen's promo and then we're all like talking, like laughing, like he's, you know, the promo about drink your milk, blah, 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 the blue blazer one. And um, then we're like, you know, we're just talking. We don't realize, I guess, 
we didn't instantly realize like the like like Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler's like expression and and like I guess what they were saying. We we were you know laughing about Owen's promo and and then when they like when the camera's on Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, it, it took a second to register like, oh, maybe that match is later. Maybe they're talking about this next match. So, so it took a minute to kind of realize what was going on. And then all of a sudden it was like, <clears throat> then it was like, oh, you know, Jim Ross is explaining that something happened to Owen. And um, uh, I just remember like then, I guess kind of like everybody else, you know, we're not sure if, is this a part of the, is this an angle? Is this a part of the show? Is this like, what's happening here? And then, um, then like, like probably like before, like, uh, I think maybe there's like a phone call. Then all of a sudden, like then the phones, then all of a sudden more people just start coming in. And then just like in my mind, man, in my memory, it just like then kind of mayhem kind of ensues of like, whoa, what's going on here? Then it found, then like Davey, and Davey found out that like Owen fell, but they, we weren't sure the the result yet. And um, and then I think I think we all stopped and then just <clears throat> uh, head down to Stu's. Wow! And then what happens from there? Then from there is uh, from there we we get word about um, about Owen passing away, and uh, now now like almost everyone's at Stu's it is just like by, by the minute more cars are pulling up. And then, um, <clears throat> and then um, I can remember like Vince, he, has, he does like a press conference or something that day. Yeah. That night. Yeah. And I think he, so he called, he called Stu's either right before or right after that press conference. I, I don't know which one. And I, I remember like the phone being passed around. Like I remember Bruce, you know, kind of, Bruce Hart ripping in, into him and, you know, Vince, I, I, I obviously can't hear Vince on the other side, but I just know like, you know, Vince took it and Stu was talking to him. Um, I think maybe a few others talked to, talked to Vince on the phone that night. Uh, it, that were at Stu's, I mean, and obviously um, <clears throat> they'd contacted Martha prior to that, I believe. And um, yeah, man, it was, I remember Stu, I can remember Stu saying like, Stu said something, and I don't know if it was like the promoter in him, but Stu said something like, uh, he, he said something to the effect of like, uh, man, I would like to Vince, like, I, I like almost like he felt bad for Vince. He said, like, I, I feel bad for you. I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right now. And that's just like, that's just how Stu was. Like he just lost his son, but he also understood that like, um, like it wasn't, it wasn't done out of malice. I think, I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't speak for him, but he, he just, um, just the way he handled things, man. Stu, Stu was so stoic with everything. Like even, even um, like when Helen passed, she passed about two years before Stu. And obviously he was sad and he was like, you know, it, it, it shook him, but he, but he was pretty stoic. He's, he's tough, man. He was so tough uh, in, inside and out, but also so generous and so nice. So, yeah, man, I just remember it was a wild, it was a wild, wild, wild. Wow, man, I, I can't even imagine. In in your opinion, how much do you think that factored into Brett not wanting to stay in WWF? Uh, oh man, oh, I mean, uh, I would think big. I would think big time. That yeah. he he definitely that definitely didn't uh, that definitely didn't help anything with with Brett and the company for sure. You, you, I mean, you mentioned you trained with Brad. Have you ever had like a formal match with him? Um, no, I, well, we've done, we've, when he came back in 2010, we did some six man tags. Right. A okay. team with him, but I never, I never wrestled against him, but we, we wrestled some tags though. But imagine, imagine Tyson Kidd versus Bret Hart. Man, I wish. I remember one time he, and I, again, I was like 16 and he was showing me, um, a leg drop and, um, at the time, you know, I'm a kid. And so every time I move, like every time someone's going to drop an elbow or leg on me, I flinch. It's just a very natural reaction. Sure. And uh, I remember like, Brett's like, all right, just don't move. And I remember like took, taking everything in me not to move. And I'm like, this is Bret Hart. And like, I got to make sure I don't move, man. And then like, boom, he drops this leg that like is so perfect and like didn't hit me. And I was like, 
oh my God, this is a real pro. This is what they do. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what really won Brett over, so I have a very, um, <clears throat> very good memory. Uh, a lot, of, like we talk about a lot in the locker room, just this, so I, I always joke and say it's a gift and a curse, but I have a crazy memory. But uh, one time when we were training at Brett's, he was talking about King of the Ring 93. And this really, I think this really won me over with Brett big time. Um, but he, he was talking about how he doesn't win any of the three matches with the sharpshooter. And um, he said, like, when he got the finishes, he saw that and was like, okay, I got to come up with, he said he had to come up with a reason, like psychologically, like, why does he not win with the sharpshooter? And um, he's like, so I had to mark a body part. He's almost like a weird quiz. He's like, so I had them, you know, I had a, I had to mark a body part. Do you remember what it was? I remember Teddy, he's like, oh yeah, your knee. And Brett said, no. And then I just remember sitting there and I was like, I remember the spot of like Brett going for the sharpshooter and like Razor grabbing his fingers. I was like, your fingers. And he's like, yeah, how did you know that? And I was like, I remember then like they're, then Mr. Perfect's grabbing them. I said, yeah, your fingers. And he, I don't know, man. I that like really won him over with me that I remembered that it was uh, the fingers. Wow. Who's your all time favorite? Oh man, that's so tough. Uh, Got a so lot of family got- members. It could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Oh man. So if you, um, I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same as you for like guys that you think are your favorite. I'm sure it alternates yeah. all the time. Mine alternates all the time. It alternates kind of with like what I watched most recently or what I, what kind of mood I'm in. Um, oh man, I'm going to have to say Brett because I watched a bunch of stuff back recently and just his, his storytelling and stuff is just so I don't know. I don't, maybe it's underrated. I don't know if it's underrated, but maybe like it would have been so cool to see Brett's style. Or, and I don't just mean Brett's style, but Brett, Brett's work right now. But it, I'd like to see it like right now, how mm. awesome it'd be. And like just that he just he did everything a little bit differently at the time, especially at the time. And I, you know, before him, everything was very uh, over the top and very animated. And then his was, a, you know, a bit more uh, reality based. And um, I don't, I just something, obviously, uh, growing up around him, I, I understand the, I, I'm biased, I get that. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man, there's something about his storytelling. I just feel like he was so ahead of his time. Like he was like 20 years ahead of his time. Yeah, like, you know, like how, like <clears throat> for me and for, for, for my world, like Randy Orton is the man, like his facials are amazing and he always knows where the cameras are. Like he's a genius when it comes to that. Everybody in, in, in like our world knows that. And, and Brett was that guy too. If you go watch those matches back, he's doing the same things. I just think he was almost ahead of the company in terms of those types of camera shots that we kind of look for now. I, Brett was really ahead of it, I think. And I'm sure it's hard to pick just one, but what's your go-to Bret Hart match? Um, so this one, is, this is a good answer because it encompasses all of them, but the Canadian Stampede. <laughs> uh, the, but of course, you Brett versus Davy and Wembley, Brett versus Owen at WrestleMania, and, and uh, I for the longest time I would I did not watch Brett and Steve Austin's WrestleMania match back because I saw it the first time and I loved it, and I was a giant Ken Shamrock fan, big UFC fan, so I just wanted to leave it in my memories and not um, harass that match. And I watched it when his DVD came out, and I remember like pressing play and almost like watching it through like. Like, I hope this is better than I, I hope it's at least as good as I remember, please. Cause I've had those matches, even of my own, where I watch a match back and I was like, Oh, I thought that was good. It's not good. Of my yeah. own matches. And man, I was like, I, I watched that match a lot. I, I watched it probably three weeks ago. Um, I think it's to me, I think it's the perfect match and with the most insane storytelling. You have three guys, you have three guys come into that match one being Ken Shamrock, the referee. And when they leave, they're all in very different roles. Yeah. Now, like, Brett, obviously, they do that double turn. Now Steve Austin is looked at as a good guy. Brett's the bad guy. Brett comes back to kick Steve a few more times, and Shamrock throws Brett down. And then Brett backs down from Shamrock. So you make Shamrock as this guy right away. Those, Brett and Austin just switched. Now the refs are trying to help Steve. Steve's beating up the refs and walking out on his own. He didn't tap out. He passed. There's just so much to that match, man. I love how you break down matches. This is amazing yeah. hearing this. 
Yeah. I, I get too into it, man. I get too into like inside baseball stuff like that. Well, how, how different do you look at matches now that you're behind the scenes producing these matches, producing these storylines? Oh yeah. Big time. Like, like it, I mean, I, I look, I try to look so into it, but the, so the secret that I've found for me is <clears throat> I, and I have to get better at this and I, and I am getting better at it, but I want to get, I want to be the best at it. I I'm very good at, I, as I think as we all are, but I'm very good at, um, really breaking something down in hindsight and being like, man, we should have put this there. And now I'm trying to get better at playing it all out in my mind before it goes out there and thinking, okay, would this be better there? Or is this better there? Or is it just good where it's at? And that's what I'm really trying to work on. Like, I would say like, I mean, always, but this last year for sure, it's what I've, 2020 is what I really tried to work on. So my new thing now with the town is I'll be like, Hey, this may totally throw you off. I'm just going to throw this out there. I want to, I want to say it to you now. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. It's fine. But let me throw you this idea because I don't want to say it after the match. And then you go to me like, damn, I wish you said it to me before. I'd rather I say it to you. Now you look at me and say, TJ, that idea sucks. And I say, okay, no problem. I just want to throw it out there. I didn't want to say it after because I've done that a million times. Hey, what if we did this? Like, ah, you're right. That would have been so awesome. And I, and I, I know because it's happened in like every match I've ever had as a talent. You always think of great. You always think of, I mean, not that, not that you don't think of great stuff prior, but you can always, you always come up with those, uh, those switches post-match. Sure. So what I'm trying to do is almost stay ahead of that a lot of times now and try to play everything out in my head and think, oh, is there any, is something better? Does something fit better? Or is what we have very good. Yeah. I can only imagine how difficult it must be. Number one, producing a match, but also two, wrestling in a match when you don't have that crowd to feed off of, because sometimes the crowd can change the whole course of the match. I mean, big time. Like that's one of my favorite stories in my own career is um, myself and Cesaro against New Day in Europe, where we wrestled on SmackDown a few weeks prior. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We wrestled on SmackDown two days before, but um, there was some, I think wherever we were is maybe a three week delay. So that match we just had on SmackDown won't air wherever we were for three weeks. Mm. So, uh, you know, we're all tired from flying in that first night. You, when, we, when we do these European tours, you fly in, like say we did SmackDown Tuesday, you fly in Wednesday, but you actually get in Thursday morning and then you have a show Thursday night and the time difference. And like you were on a plane for like 10 hours. So like, yeah. Nobody's really rested. That first show, that first show can be so hilarious. Sometimes, a lot of times they're so awesome because everyone's almost just on this, like everyone's on their second win. So nobody's blowing up because you're already in that second win and the matches usually turn out awesome. But, but the process to get into it is like, it's like starting a car that like won't quite start and it does. And then you have no problems with it for the rest of the day. Exactly what it's like on these. So anyway, we were all pretty tired and we're like, Hey, let's just, let's do something similar to what we just did on SmackDown yesterday. And then, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll spruce it up and we'll change it up for the rest of this tour, but just to get through today, which, which our match, the SmackDown one wasn't, we weren't giving them some B, what we felt was like a B match. We were giving them great stuff. It just, we were just going to kind of almost go off memory a little bit. And um, dude, we came out there and they cheered Natty Cesaro and I, and they booed New Day. And like, I did all the little things I was doing at that time. Like at one point I hide behind Natty and the crowd cheered. They cheered that. And I just like looked and I was like, I don't know what to do now. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out of ammo. I just hid behind my wife and they cheered. I, I don't know what to do. So uh, first, guy, first person asked was Cesaro. I said, hey man, um, if we switch, if we switch this, and uh, they get heat on me. Can, I know to be on the fly, but can you blow a good comeback? And he's like, yeah. So, okay. And I asked Natty, she's on the floor. Like Woods loves telling the story because he's on the floor that night. Because New Day would always switch. That was That's what was really fun about wrestling them on that tour because there's the three of them. So they would like, I would, I'd wrestle, you would, you would only wrestle the same combo like two or three times on a 12-day tour because, sure. yeah, they keep switching. So anyway, uh, Woods loves telling the story because he's on the outside. And I, and I asked him, dude, 
think we should switch and just take take heat on me and and you guys are the heels and we're the baby faces and he's like teacher why did you ask me i said dude because i never want to be accused of like going into business for myself and we've all been guilty of like maybe hearing things a little bit like oh two people cheered for me oh 300 people cheered for me it's very different so yeah. I was like, I just wanted to make sure that guys said, cause you, you and Natty were on the floor. So you guys really have like a good sense of, of the crowd's reaction. So I didn't want to, if, if we could have ch- turned them and got them to boo Cesaro and I and, and cheer for new day. And if I felt that we could have, then I would have tried to stay the course, but I just, it just was what it was. I think, you know, Cesaro obviously being, being Swiss, I think helped. And, and I, I don't know, man, it just, it, the thing is it turned out so awesome, completely on the fly. And my long-winded rant <laughs> being without fans now, like that kind of doesn't happen. It's kind of whatever we set is what is what we do, which there, there's a there's a plus and a minus to that. At least yeah. like at least it, it's kind of like in some ways directing a movie. Like if I direct a movie and this is the scene I wrote, well, I know that like a live audience isn't gonna mess any of this scene up. The scene's gonna go down the way it's the way it's written. Yep. Um it, it's like if a basketball team practices just without without an opposing team every play that runs gonna work yeah now, now you now you add another team opposing you now, now you add a crowd that maybe doesn't want what you're giving them and and all of a sudden now you're making changes and and there's a really cool and really really fun aspect of that too that that thinking on the fly and switching on the fly is it's a cool and when you see like when you see someone um that maybe you didn't or maybe maybe you didn't know they had that in them and you see them you see it click and you see them do it it's a great feeling man it's yeah. awesome you could just tell how passionate you are when you talk about wrestling. Uh, i love this i love it I, I mean you've been back in the ring recently and i think that those training videos of you being in the ring kind of started you know sending off some light bulbs for fans going man maybe tj could work another match i know i know believe me i wish I wish, but I don't, I don't dwell on it. Um, the truth is I, I, I won't wrestle again. Um, I tried uh, doing one Royal Rumble. Uh, it got a lot of thought went into it, but it got turned down. Um, and I'm not, I'm not mad at it. It, uh, it was kind of funny the way Vince laid it out to me. He said, like, just, he's like, we can control everything that we can on our power, but there's, but what if something happens? Like, what if something we don't control happens. And in my mind, where, I didn't say this to him, but where my mind went, went was like, say someone jumped the guardrail and like pushes me from behind as I'm on the steps or something. And it shocks me back. Like, I, I don't know. That's just where my mind went. Then you fast forward three months after Brett, after Vince and I are having this phone call, three months later, that guy is taking Brett and Natty down at the Hall of Fame. And like, in my mind, I was like, oh my God, I had this vision, except that was me getting taken down. Yeah. So as soon as I, like, I already was at peace with it. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, this is exactly what happened in my mind. I don't know if this is what Vince was talking about, but when he said it to me, this is what I interpreted it as. I'm good. So the idea was return at the rumble in Phoenix last year. Um, you know, not, not really return, but just kind of like give me a chance to write the final paragraph of my in ring chapter. Well, just, think of the I pop want... you would get. If your music went off, the pop you would get. I was there. I was at the Royal Rumble in Phoenix. That was a huge, Dude, so huge stadium. I have a really funny, I feel like, man, <laughs> I'm probably totally wrong, but I have a really funny, uh, for me, I feel like I have a funny connection with Phoenix. Um, we did that WrestleMania there where, uh, where we clotheslined Vince. Uh, then the next night, Harry and I wrestled Miz and did show him. Uh, we, we ended up winning by count up, but we were like just baby faces kind of by default and the people got behind us. I know that's the night after WrestleMania crowd, so it might not entirely be Phoenix, but then I've had a lot of other matches there. Like uh, I had a six man tag there on superstars once myself, uh, Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel against the Usos and Trent Beretta. And um, in terms of like hidden gems of like my matches, that, that one's probably takes the cake. And we did, that's the first time when we did like the superplex to the floor and we get like a standing ovation from that yeah. Phoenix crew. So, so the idea of you returning, did that begin with an idea that you had in your head or did someone else talk about this? Um, no, I, I always had it in my head to like at least approach the approach it and just see, obviously take it day by day, see how I felt with my neck and stuff. And I knew the secret with the Royal Rumble is that I could, I could, um, 
I could do it and not have to take any bumps. Because uh, that's the big thing. Like, yeah, I can, I can hit the ropes. I can springboard. That's okay. Probably landing on the springboard. Like, even, even springboarding and landing on my feet is probably not great for my neck. Um, but bumping is, the, bumping is the thing that stops me. Like, I can, I can do it. Like, I train these guys, and it's so fun to be in the ring. It's literally, like, lit such a fire. That and, and oh, man, I don't know. It's so crazy. It's This pandemic caused some of my best work as a producer for some reason. I don't know why. Like we, and they were rough days, some of those PC days, those double tapings. But, man, I, uh, it, but it's all just lit this fire in me. So I can kind of, like, chain wrestle a little bit with these guys and show that, like, demo a couple things. But when it comes to the action, it's almost like – now I know how these soup, uh, minus the money, I know how these super actors feel because I can do the scene. And then when it comes to the bump, it's like, cut, stuntman, I need you in here. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I need a stuntman now. We saw you in the ring recently with Brody Lee Jr. That was so cool Man. to see. It looks like that kid can work. Dude, he's insane. So, <laughs> uh, classic me. I'm, I'm always late. I'm late for like everything. Um, we call it heart time, but it's funny. Natty's usually on time and pretty good. Uh, I'm really bad. I don't, she's actually related. I'm not, but it like reverse osmosis went to me. I don't know, <laughs> but I uh, show up and Brody's there. I knew he was there, but I showed up and um, I, I didn't know this, but I guess they asked him earlier, like, do you want to go in the ring? He's like, no, I'm okay. I'll just watch. So I'm talking to him a little bit and, um, and they're, they're running drills and they were kind of, there was a little like pot, like they were done. The last few people were done obviously you know we were gonna still wrestle and i just said hey brody you uh you want to go in the ring he's like yes like he was like he didn't he didn't think about it as soon as i was even done saying it he said yes so he and i rolled in we could lock up he's you know he's strong man he does uh he does jujitsu i knew i knew he did amateur wrestling before but now he does jujitsu too so he's strong he like he came in and he like sh like shot in he, later on to live he like shot in for like a single leg but also like with his uh, outside leg like tripped her i was like okay this guy is serious so he and i are wrestling <laughs> one point he gives me something i'm kind of like selling in the corner i see him he's in the opposite corner and i was like oh what are he's gonna do he's probably just gonna run and like tackle me or something he comes flying hits me with a drop kick bang i was like what then before before i'm even like i'm just laughing before i'm even like can even like be done laughing he's already back in that other corner i'm like oh he's gonna do another one wrong cannonball bang what? man he's wow. funny man he has energy forever he it was hard to get him out of that ring in, in a in a good way and i was like okay and uh little nolan was in there too and then i was like okay uh, let's let them wrestle for a little bit and then um i have these little crash pads and he's like can we can we jump on the on the crash pad i said yep so we brought it over uh stacked the two on top of each other then he just kept dude he just kept jumping off the steps and like he would do a frog splash or he would do a coffin drop or he would do a leg drop or he would do an elbow or he would do a swanton. And then, then he started making me um, call out different wrestlers and he would do their move onto this crash pad. And man, and he just kept jumping, jump. And then, then he realized like if they weren't hitting the ropes, he could jump on the apron and it's a little bit higher than the steps. So jump on the steps, jump on the apron and jump onto the pad. And oh my man, and energy for days. Wow. It's like he got all of this from his father. I, man, so um, I, I've said this. It was it was wild. I kept watching him, and um, obviously he knows what he's doing. But I wonder, like, how much of it is just like he's just been probably doing this for so long in terms of playing. But he kept doing like the Brody thing, and he kept doing like the spinning clothesline. And I'd be like looking at his face, and it was like his face just glowing. He's time of his life. But then he's also a little heel. He like we're all up, we're like all on the outside of the ring. He's like wrestling with Liv, then he comes to like shake our, you know, high five us. And then when you go to high, he goes, ah, you suck. Then next thing you know, it was wow. really funny. It was really funny because he didn't, he, at one point, <laughs> at one point he's like, uh, Teddy showed up, Teddy Hart. And Brody's kind of a promo on Teddy. He's like, get in here if, if you even think you have a chance. Was, wow. <laughs> and how he old was, is he? He's eight. Oh my God. Yeah, he's unbelievable, man. Wow, this is a star in the making. Uh, yeah, and and the little brother is like so tough too. He's Bro Brody. Brody's a you could tell he's a good big brother. They're wrestling around. It, it was cool, man. It was so cool to see, um, you know, just even see. Uh, I'm not around them a lot, but even just 
if that was like, if that just helped them kind of escape things for two minutes is yeah. 10 times is worth everything. Yeah. Whose wrestling school were you guys at for that? Oh, that's, that's my, that's mine. I did. I have yeah. a, I have a warehouse and a ring like 20 minutes from my house. But it's not an official wrestling school. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not a school. It's just kind of like a private club. Or it's not a school yet. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm sure I think- eventually I just, it's one of those things I've, I've toyed with in my mind a lot. I've trained, I trained people before when I was younger and um, it's definitely something I like doing. I just, I wasn't sure if, why I didn't want to open a full on school, especially, well, I mean, first off this, this pandemic is a part of it, but also when I trained people before I could physically do everything. So I could physically show you, mm-hmm. I didn't know if I'm a good trainer at this level where I can't physically do everything like, um, being a producer is a little bit similar in terms of helping put matches together. But, but like, for example, if I'm helping, if I'm helping, you know, Natty versus Natty versus Becky put a match together. I don't not, I don't have to teach them how to take a back bump. They're yeah. super advanced. You know what I mean? So it's a little bit different, but what I've realized is like, as long as I have like another good, like almost, like a second coach under me that he can actually demo the stuff and I can explain it and kind of demo things. Like I said, to a point where I need my stunt, my stunt band to come in. Um, (laughs) Yeah. What do you not feel comfortable in the ring doing because of your neck? Um, I think mostly just bumping. And I don't, have you taken any bumps in the last six years? No, no bumps. Just, uh, just I'm, well, mine, minus the the one I took on the treadmill at the at the gym one day that I pretended nobody saw, but I like <laughs> ate, ate it on a ate it on the treadmill. Someone left the treadmill on, like maybe like point two or three, but I didn't. I thought it was like so slow. I literally thought it was off, and yeah. I like so I stepped on the side, and then I put like one foot on, but not realizing, and it just like it just took me, and I like hit my. I remember like I was doing an hour of cardio, and I like. I didn't want to look down, but my hand, when I did find like 20 minutes later after the stinging went away, my hands were all scraped, my knee, my shins oh. were like, and I was like, okay. I remember thinking, oh, that's the first bump I've taken in quite a few years. <laughs> what do you think's one thing that you now know as a producer that you wish you had known when you were wrestling? Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of the camera stuff. And, you know, and that, that might be kind of vague, but I think a lot of like the camera stuff in terms of like, just how to get the best camera shots of everything and how to, how I would have been a, like, I, like I talked with uh, Jason Jordan about this a bunch too. Cause he, he's always talks about it. He's like, man, if I, if it happens and if he wrestles again, he's like, I have such a different knowledge now. You just, and just sitting in a room of like all these guys, like Michael Hayes and John, Johnny Laurinaitis and Fit Finley and Mike Rotundo and Dean Malenko and Arn Anderson, like you and Vince and you Hunter, like you can't sit, you can't sit in a room with these guys uh, week after week after week and not pick up all types of stuff. There might be some stuff that you're like, well, it doesn't really work for me, but there's so much that you just are like, wow, damn, why didn't I think, I wish I thought about that and I presented that, damn. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I think camera wise, certain things. And I, uh, I said this, bef- I've said this to like, I think like, it's funny, we're like right now, the big thing is, um, because like you said, we don't have an audience. So it's like, it's, we have to almost manifest this, um, this intensity ourselves mm. uh, that the, that a lot of times the audience helps bring out, you know, in that, that vibe. And uh, so it's a matter of like, how do you, how do you psych yourself up for that? And I've kind of like, that was one thing I, I was good at in terms of like, I wrestled at that. I was in FCW for two years. I wrestled a lot of practice matches and the empty. I wrestled a lot of people's like first kind of matches, like Dave Otonga's first kind of matches at the arena with me. Uh, Bo Rotundo, one of his first matches or very first is with me. I wrestled a lot of people's like first matches. So I've wrestled in that environment of like no fans. And, but, but like when producers would come down to FCW, you got to treat it. Yeah. There's no fans. There's just the, your peers, but you have to treat it. Like it's the biggest thing ever. You can't, can't yeah. phone in those days that the producers come down. Right. What do you think is the biggest piece of feedback that you're giving before or after a match to the, to the matches that you're producing? um, So originally I was 
saying in, in terms of this pandemic, I was saying like, hey, and it was advice that was given to all of us, but I was like, hey, don't, don't rush things. You're, probably there's going to be a tendency to rush because there's not, um, there's not an audience to kind of react to and let them do their thing and then move on to the next. And it was like, so you're going to feel like a, a natural and that, oh, sorry, let me let this guy. <laughs> I knew the cats would come back in a player and you're, I didn't realize he was, done, he was done listening to my stuff. You've been sitting on a workout bench this whole time. I yeah, love it's, it. it. It's comfy. A real gym uh, rat. <laughs> yes. Big time. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that was my biggest advice at the beginning of the pandemic with this is just hey, try not to rush. I know it's going to be really hard. And then now we have, now we have like that audio. So it, it helps. But when there were no fans, I remember like the Usos against New Day. Uh, I believe yeah, it was Usos and New Day had a match at the PC where they kind of treated it like uh, it felt like a game of like pickup basketball almost like there's a lot of trash talking between we didn't have uh, the NXT people as fans at this point. So it's no fans. You just hear the announcers and what's happening in the ring. So they treated it like where they just kind of like trash talk the whole time. And it was this awesome vibe. And then that became kind of like guys like that was like that was the blueprint of like how how I think this is done. So, um, so yeah, that I'd say that, that, so that audio that we hear on TV of the fans, that's actually piped in to the arena too. Yeah. So the first, the first day, uh, at Amway, it was not. And, um, Bailey actually, she's like, TJ, it's so awkward. It's cause now that we've gotten used to the NXT audience. So it at least was a little something, you know? Yeah. And, um, so then I remember in the meeting, they were like, Hey, uh, what did everybody think? He's like, yo, that Thunderdome looks awesome for, for what we have in terms of like what, where the world's at at the moment, this is amazing. Um, and I just said in the meeting, I said, is there any way, or does it mess you guys, does it mess up the production to, uh, pipe the noise into the arena? Cause I think it will help the talent. I said, I, I spoke with a lot of talent, um, from the week before. And they said like this, that, that was kind of what was missing. And then yeah, Kevin was like, yeah, it's no problem. And then, so they pump it in and I think it helps. It t- I think it helps a lot. At least, at least kind of helps you have a chance of like losing yourself in it and letting go. And it, cause it, obviously you can, if you just sit and think, oh, these, it's not real noise. And like, it's not like the audience is real people that are, but virtually if you psych yourself out, it was, I'm sure it's probably easy to really psych yourself out in this environment. So the wrestlers have you to thank for that crowd noise. This is your idea. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like to think that I definitely have my pulse on the talent, and I um, I ask them questions, and I was I mean ba- Bailey, she's the one who told me, she's uh, SmackDown uh, that the first Thunderdome was a SmackDown, so then that was Friday, so then the following Monday is when so two days later I just asked Kevin if we could just pipe in the noise. I thought it would help, and then I, but I so Bailey like brought it to my attention, and I asked a lot of people, and they all kind of said the same that they thought the noise would help them. So yeah. What do you think's been the biggest lesson that you've learned personally over this last, you know, over the, over the lockdown, over the last 10 months? Man, <sighs> I guess, and I, I, I used to think I was good at it, but maybe I've gotten better, but you got to kind of live in the moment. I think we've realized, I think we realized like what our plans are for tomorrow. That's cool. It's cool to have plans for tomorrow, but I mean, For example, like back last March, March, 2020, um, I was getting a haircut on a Thursday and I had a flight to Detroit a few hours later. And I got a call from Johnny telling me, Hey, have you flown already? Cause a lot of times I'll book an, like, for example, going to Phoenix, I'll book a super early flight and go straight to, and I I like being there the whole day. And he said, did you didn't book an early flight this week? Did you? I said, no, I'm, I'm home. Uh, oh, I'm in, I'm in Florida. And he said, okay, he said, don't, don't, uh, don't get on the plane. He said, we're not, we're not running Detroit tomorrow. We're going to run in the PC. So like, but the day before and, and all that day, I thought I was going to Detroit. And yeah. so like, I think what we've learned through this is it's good to have plans, but they may not, you got to just be patient and kind of like live in that moment. Yeah. This is, the, this is also the same advice you had for, you know, the, the wrestlers when they were starting to work, be patient. This is like a yeah. big takeaway here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think, I mean, this has really taught a lot of us to, to kind of slow things down a little bit and to like yeah. absorb everything and like kind of take it in and then, and then, and then react. Yeah. 
How close do you think they were to having WrestleMania in Tropicana Field? Because I feel like you know, there were PC shows and there was Raw, there was a SmackDown, then there was Raw, then there was NXT, and we were all kind of going, yeah, but WrestleMania can't be in the PC. Oh, uh, at, Raymond, at Raymond James? Oh, sorry, Raymond James, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, I, I thought it was, I don't know, I thought it was close, and uh, but I also, I don't know, I, I guess there was a part of me that was like, man, I don't think WrestleMania, I remember, like, I remember when that hit me, I was like, I don't think WrestleMania is going to happen. Yeah. At Raymond James. And I was like, and if so, it might happen. And I, so what I thought actually was Raymond James, but empty, empty Raymond James. I think that's what a lot of people thought. Yeah. Which I don't know, like, I, I guess now with our Thunderdome style setup with the LED and all that, it would, it would look good. But in that moment, I, uh, you know, it, it's WWE, it's WrestleMania, but it would just would have been so, what, what is it? What is a, you know, a 65 or 80,000 <laughs> Seat stadium look like empty with a ring in the middle of it. That's a long walk down to the ring <laughs> with no one cheering you on. Usually that's at least uh, a 50 yard uh, walk. That, that ramp is usually 50 yards. There was the one year, uh, maybe it was Orlando. I don't know if it was Orlando. Was long, yeah. yeah, maybe 70 or 80. <sighs> <What? Yeah. laughs> wow. I, I do have to say though, I think WrestleMania is my favorite pay-per-view of last year because of how quickly WWE was able to put everything together. Like you guys did that with like two weeks notice after building for 14 months, planning to do this in a football stadium. I know, yeah. And man, and the talent killed it, man. Like I couldn't believe WrestleMania. Um, like that, that three-way uh, ladder match, it was gonna oh, have yeah. a ladder match. Those guys are having a ladder match literally with no fans. Like, as a wrestler, it'd literally be like I show up at wrestling practice. Like, today we're going to train tonight. Imagine the guys show up and I have a ladder. I'm like, all right, guys, we've got a ladder match today. We're doing only ladder matches today. You guys are first. You guys will be on second. Like, it just would be insane. Yeah. And to give, like, a WrestleMania level ladder match. Um, man, uh, you know, uh, I'm always going to have the highest praise for our talent, but our talent across the board, man, like I love these people. They, they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> like that woman's five way. I love that match at WrestleMania. And, and that one was cool because there were five of them. So there's not an audio. Yes, we had our announcers, but the, like I said, the only sound you really hear is the, is the ring and the announcers, no fans. So yeah. if you watch it back, there's a lot of dialogue happening with, with Bailey, with Sasha, with Naomi, Lacey, Tamina, and, and it became a very awesome and cool thing. And I think that's where like they really started to find, I think, and I actually I had this talk with Edge when I saw him recently. Um, this is definitely not an, the most ideal situation. We all know that. But what we've really learned from this is who, who can work, who can work and who can speak. Mm. Because a lot of times, and it's not a bad thing, but a lot of times we use the audience as a crutch yeah. and there's, there's no crutch. <laughs> yeah. You just got, you just got to go. And, um, and maybe the people who maybe weren't as good at it, but now here we are 10 months later, maybe they're awesome at it now. And it's, it's, I've seen so much growth. That's the crazy thing about, you would think that in this environment, it'd be really easy to coast, I guess. And across the board, like everything I'm watching, nobody's coasting. Yeah. And that's so awesome to see. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I like that you mentioned Edge, and I'm so glad that he had his moment with the crowd at the Royal Rumble. Oh, man. Yes. Yes. It, so you know what? This is the biggest thing I say to town. We'll, when I, I'll say we'll, I'm the producer. I'm not in there. We'll have, a, we'll have a, what I feel is an awesome match. And I, I, they're probably so sick of hearing me say it. I was like, man, you guys killed it. That, imagine this moment. If there had been a crowd there, imagine that one. If there had been a crowd, ah. and they, know, they know. Hopefully, we all, we all beat it to death. You know, hopefully this can be you know, at least maybe even small crowds coming back. I hope it's a thing soon. Yeah, like I know uh, UFC. The Connor fight is going to have like two thousand fans. Well, that's also in Abu Dhabi. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Situation there, and and even like that's kind of like when someone told me that. Uh, Two days ago, I was like, 2,000 fans? I don't know. Is that better than, like, is it better just to have no fans? 
like for example, for Connor, it's such a big um, his fights are such big spectacles. He wanted to and do was, this at Cowboy Stadium. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and to do, to do it with two thousand fans is like I don't know. Is it better than zero fans? You know what I'm saying? Like I don't know. It's it's really funny. UFC is really interesting because you know you'll have commentators like Joe Rogan or DC or Michael Bisping who know the ins and outs of every move. They'll call something out, and then you'll see the fighters adjust to it in the, yeah. in the octagon. It's so crazy to see. Yeah, the, the, one, the one guy he thanked uh, DC on his post fight. He said, "Thanks, DC. You heard him." But so I'm, may- I'm I'm a I'm a big like uh, big fan, and I love I love watching it way better without the fans. To be perfectly honest. It's a much more pure fight, I feel like. Yeah, Ben, you nailed it. It's very pure. And you, like, I love being able to hear the corners, but, like, not just between rounds, but during the fight as well. It's so cool. And, I mean, if you're a fight fan, obviously you, you got to love the sounds of the shots that are yeah. not being – sometimes you don't always hear it with the audience. If they're going crazy, you don't hear it all. But, like, that Gaethje Ferguson fight, you heard it, everything. Yeah. So, okay, so who do you like, Connor or Poirier? In this um, fight, I, I just had this conversation. I know I'm, I'm name dropping here. I just had this conversation with Booker T. So uh, I hope I he picked Poye. I picked uh, Connor. So we'll see. Wow. I, I well, I, I think you can't sleep on Dustin, but I think that Connor I, think, I think Dustin's awesome. I yeah. just think um, I, we'll see. Obviously, uh, on social media, nobody posts uh, the worst of themselves usually. Uh, but I think I, in terms of like being a fan, I don't think I've ever seen Connor look better in terms of what I've seen out there. Agreed. And they're fighting in a different weight class. I mean, we could go yeah. in a completely different discussion about this, but it's going to be interesting. I, I picked Connor second round KO. I could see that. I, I just saw Connor says within the first 60 seconds, cowboy style. We'll see. I don't know. That, that sounds be, like that something he would extreme. say. That might be a bit extreme. I think I think Connor cuts better promos than most wrestlers. <laughs> he cuts better promos than most people, period. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Politicians too. Look, TJ, I've really enjoyed this chat. It's so good catching up with you. It's been two and a half years since I've had you on the wow. show. Yeah, it's crazy. And that yeah, like we were saying earlier, like we just ran into each other there that day and just kind of did that interview. And it was like that was I loved that conversation, but I'm glad that now we were able to like set a date, set a time, and make this thing happen. It was so funny because it's it just funny how that was two and a half years ago. At that point, all I at that point, I just kept having um Seth's matches. I just kept working so much with Seth. And now things have changed. And now I just work with the girls. And so like mm. it's just funny, like, and two and a half years later, I'm uh I'm so much better at my job now than I was then, but I needed, I needed all that time to put in. It's like everything, but I needed to put all that time in to get to this point now. But like, uh, the guys like Seth and Dolph were such a, you know, Michael Hayes, Jamie Noble, but in terms of the talent, Seth and Dolph, they helped me so much to like get back, get into it and, and, and feel it and and actually get where I was good at this from being like, yeah, it was awesome. Two and a half years from now, you'll be that much better. Uh, I hope so. I end every interview by asking, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Because I say that if you can be grateful, you will live a great life. Wow. Wow. Three things. I mean, obviously my health, that's something I don't, um, I don't take lightly. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, throughout this pandemic i've been able to to continue working and continue again that's what's the crazy part is like uh i felt like 2020 as a producer was my been my best work like by a lot like by a lot and that wouldn't have if if um if everything if we'd shut down too i wouldn't have been able to to do that and it's um so i'm, I'm grateful i'm grateful that uh Grateful for that. And um, third one, yeah, uh, I guess I'm just like, ah, uh, man, I don't know. This one's, it's tough. It's tough to just narrow it down to three things. You could just, uh, you know, all encompass it and say the family. Then you got Natty, then you get yeah, the cats, you get everybody. I mean, for sure, for sure. My family, like, like my mom, I know she's a little bit worried about, uh, she was obviously worried about COVID and stuff. And she's obviously been fine this whole time. So, um, 
yeah, definitely. Of course, family. But I just was throwing that in, with, I guess, with my own health. But my health and then my family's health. And the, and the health of the cats. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, one of the guys just, he had a hernia. The one that was in here, Louie, he had a hernia that he had to get fixed. He he had uh, crystals in his bladder and stuff. So he's, he's, oh. he's good now. He's put his weight back on. Uh, no issues. So he's been... He's been great, but uh, he the the vet the vet loves him when he comes in because they know uh, a lot of money's coming their way. <laughs> I said this before, and I'll say it again: no one loves cats more than T.J. Wilson. No, man, I love him. Love him. <laughs> thank you so much, man. No, this Chris, is great. Thank you, dude. Thank you very much, man. I, anytime. This is fun. <laughs>